Amen, amen. Y'all can sit down unless you want to stand during the entire sermon. That's all right with me. <laughs> Whatever suits you. We're going to be in John 2 today. Grab your Bibles. Let's go to John 2. And uh, we're going to hang out there together. I love being in Revelation, but now I'm glad we get to shift gears and go into some stories about Jesus Christ and the lives he did. I find it incredibly ironic that we start a miracle series on the day after the Cubs clinched the World Series appearance <laughs> for the first time in a long time. Man, I hope you all worshiped like that today. All right. The Cubs, Jesus. All right, anyway, that's my little lesson for you. I believe in miracles. Y'all believe in miracles? I believe in miracles. I, I believe that God is a God of miracles, that Jesus did miracles as God in the flesh when he was here. I believe the Holy Spirit lives in us and in this church, and he still does miracles. I'm not talking about baseball miracles. I'm talking about the kinds of miracles where lives are radically changed. I have seen people prayed over and completely be healed of cancer. In my 31 years, I have seen people who are barren and can't have kids have four and five kids after prayer. I have seen people pray in this place for a family member who's lost, who's going to come maybe on Easter Sunday, and unknowingly that person sits in the exact seat they were praying in. I believe that God does miraculous stuff. And if you're here today and you're a visitor and maybe you're a little skeptical and you're going, I don't know. I found that some people that don't really believe or they're skeptical about miracles, they've asked God for miracles, but he hasn't, asked, he hasn't answered them exactly the way they wanted, so they're like, I don't believe. That's, that's okay, because if you're here today and you're skeptical, everybody has a little doubt from time to time, and all of us begin with doubt. Would you just kind of journey with us the next several weeks, and let's look at the life of Christ, this eyewitness testimony of John. John the apostle is saying, hey, you can say it didn't turn water to wine, but I saw it. I was there. So these ancient stories, these eyewitness accounts from John will be our text for the next several weeks. I hope that you'll invite um, Jesus to talk to you if you're a skeptic here today. For those of us who do believe in miracles, there's a deeper question we have to answer. And we kind of answer it all the time. We ask it all the time. Where do miracles happen? Where, how, how do they happen? When do they happen? We, we, somehow we'd like to figure out, we believe that God does miracles and we need a miracle, so how do we figure this out? Where do they happen? Where do they take place? And as we're going to discover in the next several weeks, and I, this begins us on this journey here at Eastview Christian Church, almost all the miracles of Jesus happen in the margin of life. They happen in the unspectacular places. Jesus never held a healing conference. You think about this? Just put up a big tent on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, healing from the Messiah this week, and thousands would have come, and he would have healed every one of them. Jesus didn't have a television show. He didn't slick his hair back, have a cool suit. He didn't do all that stuff. He wasn't a televangelist. Jesus didn't sell a, He didn't have a best-selling book called Heal, Heal Thyself. He didn't have any of that stuff. He's the greatest healer of all time, but he didn't heal the way that you and I expect. He didn't do it in the spectacular moment. Jesus did it like today at weddings on funerals, along the way as he was just walking, during a storm, by a pool, during the Sabbath day of rest in the temple. Most of the, of the miracles of Jesus seem to be impromptu, unplanned. It just kind of happened. And there's something for us to learn here because part of the problem of us experiencing miracles is that we have so little margin. We don't go to weddings. We don't walk in the way. We don't pay attention in the quiet times. And I believe we're missing tons of miracles because our lives are so busy, so scheduled, so hectic, so stressed. We don't have time to, for Jesus to do miracles in us. And we don't have time to notice the miracles he's doing. How many of you in here, you, you say your schedule is hectic. It's, it's crazy. It's insane. I got too much. I'm stressed. Today, I believe God is calling us to move away from that kind of lifestyle. I believe with all my heart, and the elders believe this, that God is calling us to be a fearless church of Christ followers whose ridiculous love and dangerous witness are irresistible. But here's the rub. We can't do that vision because we're too busy. There's no way we're ever going to fearlessly follow Jesus when we don't have time for prayer in the morning. There's no way we're going to ridiculously love people when we are moving too fast to notice the people who need to be loved. There's no way we're going to witness to people when we zoom into our garage and zoom out of our garage and never talk to anybody who needs the Lord. There's no way we'll fulfill this, this vision of ours without us slowing down some. So here's the deal. We are going to, we're going to challenge each other. 
over the next month or so to create margin so that we can notice Jesus doing miracles in our lives. Margin for miracles. That's what we're thinking about this week. That's what we're praying about. We've been praying about it for months. But, and here's the, the challenge before I get to John 2. What if three or 4,000 disciples of Jesus decided we are going to carve out time and make room for God? And we're going to stand back and we're going to watch him do miraculous stuff in our lives. What if we did that? In the name of God, I pray pray that's what we do. Let's read John chapter 2. Let's get excited about this very first miracle that Jesus did. The first sign, John the Apostle calls it. John chapter 2, verse 1. Here here it goes. You all ready for the word of the Lord today? Okay, here we go. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were, si- some, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. They filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would come in this place today. I pray that you would increase the faith of your disciples. I pray that you would convict us that we're too busy. We're too busy for the miracles of Jesus. Help us, God. Help us clear the path. Help us clear the day. Help us clear our minds. Help us clear the schedule so that you can be the Lord. In the midst of that, God, I ask that you would do miraculous things here today. Begin with our hearts. I, I'm not going to preach unless I believe that you will do miraculous heart work here today. Would you change us, soften us, convict us, move us by the power of Jesus Christ, his death and his burial, his resurrection, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, would you come in here today and convict us and change us? Begin with me. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The very first miracle Jesus ever did, according to John, was turn the water to wine. Now, if you're like me, I grew up in a church that was non-alcohol drinking church, teetotaling church. We never heard this story in Sunday school because you can't teach little kids. Sometimes Jesus makes wine, right? At least not in my setting, right? Now, again, uh, I'm not going to go into this whole thing about some in here drink wine, some don't drink wine. It's not an issue of salvation, okay, so give freedom there. But here's what I will say. The wine was different in the first century. The first century wine drinking, especially in the Jewish context, they, they they couldn't pasteurize it. They couldn't change it. They couldn't do a bunch of things to make it more alcoholic. Uh, So it was a low-grade alcohol in the first place. It wasn't grape juice. I can almost assuredly historically tell you that. But it was low-grade, you know, low level of alcohol. And Jewish people often cut it with water. Sometimes two to three parts water to wine. So you can imagine the kind of wine they were drinking. Although it is wine, so guess what? You can get drunk on it. The guy says here, he says, hey, usually you wait till people are too much. Then you bring out the cheap stuff. Right? But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus made wine, and he made very good wine. He turns the water into wine. But this story is not about wine. This story is about something bigger. I think God wants us to teach us through this scripture and through all the scriptures we're going to look at the next seven weeks that he wants to do something in the, in the timing and the everyday rhythm of our life. You know where miracles happen? Miracles happen in obscure little villages at a wedding. They don't happen planned very often. I just want you to notice the time elements that are mentioned here. Look in verse 1. It's the third day. On the third day. The third day from what? Nobody knows. A lot of Bible scholars and smart guys, they try to figure this out. It's the third day reference to Jesus' third day resurrection, maybe. It's the third day after he started recruiting disciples, which he did in John chapter 1, maybe. It's the third day on their journey when they finally got to the wedding, maybe. It's the third day of the wedding, maybe, because it's a seven-day affair. 
We don't know what the third day signifies. What we do know, it was a specific time. John noted it. It was the third day. And if it was the third day after Jesus had recruited him as a disciple, then John's brand new as an apostle. He's thinking back to those first days. Oh, remember it was like the third day we came to this wedding. It was in Cana of Galilee. I want you to see some other time references here. Verse 4. He says to his mom, he says, my hour has not yet come. My hour. Jesus uses this phrase all the way through the book of John to, re, to talk, talk about what he really came for. I didn't come here to do miracles. I came here to do something greater, to seek and to save the lost. And I've got an hour for doing that, and that's my passion. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to answer to you, mom. By the way, some of you probably don't like the way he talked to his mom here, right? Some of you moms say, don't sass me, boy. You may be the Messiah, but I am your mom, right? It would be something like that, right? Uh, but he wasn't being disrespectful. In the first century, vernacular, woman is not a derogatory term. On the other hand, it's not the term for mom, which he could have used. I think that Jesus is making a distinction here. Mom, for 30 years I've been your son. I've grown up in your house. You've taken care of me. I love you dearly. One of the last things he's going to do on the cross is take care of his mom's retirement, right? But right now I'm the son of God. And I'm starting my ministry, and it's all about my hour. All through his life, he would say this thing, my hour has not yet come, or the hour has not yet come. His brothers at one time say, you should go to the feast and get famous. Jesus goes, my hour has not yet come. One time they picked up stones to try to kill him in John. And it says he slipped through them for his hour had not yet come. Later in life, as he gets closer to the cross, it says, he says, my hour has come. Because what I came to do, it's time. And Jesus Never, ever, I just want you to notice this, this just jumped out at me this week. Jesus never allowed anyone, even his mom, to take over his schedule. He, he, never, he never allowed his mom to, to say, hey, Jesus, I need you to fix this right now. He, 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 he had this eternal purpose that was designated by his hour, but he was always able to live in the present moment with this eternal purpose. I think this is this sermon that they didn't even get next door. But some of us, we cannot handle our schedule because we don't know what our eternal purpose is. If you know your eternal purpose, then you can figure out how to schedule your life. Jesus had it figured out. And so I want you, one other, one other timing word here I want you to look at in verses 8 and 9 and 10. It says, Jesus says, now, now take some and give it to the master of the feast. And then at the end, he says, but you, end of verse 10, you have kept the good wine until now. This seems profound to me. Maybe it's not because I'm very simple-minded. You know where miracles happen? Now. They don't happen then. They don't happen in the future. Miracles ha happen in the now, which means that if you want to experience a miracle, you got to be in the now. you got to be there in the now. That's the next thing. It's, it's, it's an everyday place. You have to be there. Okay, this place is a miracle that takes place in an insignificant little village called Cana. If he did not do this miracle here, none of us would know anything about Cana. It's an obscure little town. Okay? I'll give Leroy a break. It's Downs. Okay? <laughs> it's Downs. All right? It's, nobody goes there except to drive through there. There was a major road through there. Nobody goes there on purpose. Right? But Jesus went there for a wedding. That's the first miracle was done in a specific place at a wedding. And guess who was there? The whole town was there. The whole town. Because in the first century, you didn't RSVP. You didn't save the date. When you heard that one of your neighbors was getting married and there's going to be a seven-day feast, the whole town shuts down. They all pitch in. Everybody is a part of this thing. And it's very important for the people who are hosting it to have enough for everybody to, ha to, to have enough to eat. Listen, here's the deal. Um, most of us would have missed this miracle because we were too busy. We would have to say, no, we can't come. Okay? Jesus was never too busy. He never stressed. I love what one author described this week, described Jesus with one word, and an author said, relaxed. Can you believe it? Of all the things you can say about Jesus, he was relaxed. He was. He was the savior of the whole world. He came to seek and to save the lost. He was going to change the eternities of all of us for forever, and he was not hurried. His schedule was not hectic. Jesus never got up and said, man, i got a busy day tomorrow. i got to get up for an early morning walk like usual across the lake. And then uh, I, you know, I, I'm busy. i got a 9 o'clock uh, you know, apostles meeting. i got discipleship training class at 10. I'm speaking to 5,000-person fish fry at noon. And I've got some miracles scheduled this afternoon. You know, I'm still working on my sermon on the mount. I mean, it's pretty important, right? 
Jesus could have been hectic. He could have been rushed. He could have had too much to do. He could have been running past the people who were in need. But Jesus always seems to be present. He's at a wedding in Cana. This nowhere place and this <laughs> nowhere thing in, in terms of him saving the world. Let's practice changing this for the month of November, Eastview, would you? Can, can three or 4,000 of us together covenant to say, hey, let's be different. Let's clear some margin in our lives so that Jesus can do some miracles in our lives. Let's clear some margin so that we can see what God is up to. Let's practice looking more like Christ. Here's what we have to acknowledge. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And his schedule looks nothing like ours. I'm not the Savior of the world. I'm busier than Jesus. That's crazy. Why have we done this to ourselves? Well, you know what? For the next month or, or, or six weeks, we want to pray together that God would help us declare war on busyness. Declare war on busyness so that we can see the miracles that happen all around us. Okay, so I'm asking you, would you join me in spiritual discipline of creating margin for God to work miracles over the next several weeks, beginning November 1st? In your e-news notes today, if you got your, you know, your uh, iPhones and all that stuff, or you got the hard copy, there's a li usually list prayers, but today there's a list of ways that you can create margin in your in your uh, life. Those are just suggestions. A lot of them have to do with media, you know, your cell phones, your emails, all that stuff. It, you, we need to make a switch. Let me tell you what I'm committed to do, okay? I never, I never preached you to do something unless I'm going to lead you, okay? So first, I'm going to start off the month of November for three days, no contact with email, iPhone, any, any contact, social media, none of that. I'm just going to shut it down. I'm just going to fast from that for three days. And then, and this is hard, every hour, every first hour of my morning for the month of November, I'm not going to look at my phone or my emails, Must look at weather, right? <laughs> you, if you don't think that's hard, just try it one day. Because I guarantee you the first thing that most of us do every morning is like, click. I did that one morning a few months back, and I got an email from somebody that was kind of disgruntled and not happy with it. And it just ticked me off to start today. And I'm like, I'm in the shower going, I'm mad. <laughs> For what? Because somebody didn't like something. I don't think that's the way God wants me to start my day. So I'm not going to let anybody interfere with my day till I've talked to God and I've been in the Word, and then we'll address whatever needs are there. But that's my thing. What is your thing? Would you please join us in saying, I am going to cut something out of my schedule so I can create margin for God to do miracles in my life. A couple of books you can get today at the bookstore uh, for a big discount. Crazy Busy by Kevin DeYoung. If you're a guy, Crazy Busy is for you. It's short, easy to read. Uh, and then the other one's An Unhurried Life by Alan Fadling, and it's a good book on how you cr create margin. We're going to do this together. We want to encourage each other to love and good deeds. And so we're going to ask you in the next couple of weeks as you say, here's what I'm going to do. Um, that you post on your social media using the hashtag ECC Miracles so we can go, oh, look at all that everybody's doing. Don't get stuck with those 35. Make up some of your own. Join us. Now, the grand irony is, is that some of us are going to fast from social media for a month. So post it and then get off. <laughs> Just give us your little farewell video and then post it on ECC Miracles and see you later. All right. Then later in the month, we're going to come back and we're going to share with one another, what is God doing? What did you see because you created margin for God to do miraculous stuff in your life? Listen, guys, I'm excited about this because I want you to see this word again. It, it comes up in verse 2 and then the last verse that we read together, verse 11. Jesus was also uh, invited to the wedding with his disciples. In verse 11, his disciples believed him. That word disciples is what we get the fearless follower from. Disciple means to learn by following. It's methetes. It really means student or pupil. The, the way that we get into the life, the miraculous life work of Jesus Christ, is to be there where he's at. So many of us follow Jesus Christ, but we're not really following him because we're never where he is. So getting there is the beginning. You've got to be in Cana. You've got to be there a certain time on the third day to see this miracle. But that's only part of it. The next thing you need, you have, you have to have a need and you have to have faith and, ob and obedience. Those are the three things. I can't count. I did like, need faith, obedience. <laughs> These three things, right? Sorry. My brain's kind of malfunctioning today. Anyway, uh, so it begins with a need. There's, a, there's an honest need here that Mary shares with Jesus. They have no wine. I don't know if she's in the kitchen. I don't know what's going on in this story. I don't know if she's in charge. 
I don't know if she feels bad because it's a younger couple, but this is a major deal. It's a major social faux pas to run. You invite people, and, and hosting people and hospitality was huge. How, how would you guys feel if you invited a bunch of people to a Christmas party, and then you ran out of food about halfway through? And people got there late, and you couldn't serve them. You feel bad. You're rushing around to buy pizza. They can't do that in Cana, right? They've run out of wine. This is something that could perhaps be a stigma against this couple the rest of their lives. Some people would actually see it in the first century as a bad omen for their marriage. Oops, they ran out of wine. That's not going to last, right? That's how they would see it. And so Mary has this emergency. She comes to Jesus. She has some no. They've drained the last wineskin. It's empty. No more wine. She comes to Jesus. Why does she come to Jesus? Because she believes he can do something about it. She comes to Jesus. Here's a need, Jesus. I'm just letting you know the need. The wear of miracles, the place we find miracles begins with a need. Some of us don't care about water or wine running out. But we've run out of something, most of us. Some of us in here, we have no hope. Some of us in here, we have no health. Some of us in here, we have no love relationship. Some of us in here have no place where we belong. Some of us in here are empty, like this this wine skin was empty. We've run out of time. We've run out of faith. We've run out of forgiveness. We've run out of patience. What What are you empty on today? What's your empty? Because miracles always begin with an empty. Miracles always begin with a deep need that someone has. A miracle prayer literally is this. God, I have no this. Would you do something? That's how miracle prayers go. Everybody can pray because when you need a miracle, you say, God, fix this. That's a miracle prayer. I've got a need. And then when you ask, when you have a need, then you've got to trust that God can do something. It's not like Mary got a good answer here. You, you would like it to read, Jesus, you know, she comes to him in verse 3, they have no wine. And Jesus says to her, Mom, I'll get right on it. That's not what he says. It's not like she got a yes from her son. It's not like, you know, good boy, I knew you're the Messiah. You're the best son ever. Right? And you're going to do this miracle. She didn't know if he would do something about the wine. She had no idea how he would if he did. But she believed in her heart that he could. And so she says the next thing. I think this is one of the greatest faith statements in the Bible. Verse 5, do whatever he tells you. Why? I love the persistence of mom. Jesus, Jesus, the wine is out. Fix it. You know, mom, this is not my hour. Okay, hey, servant guys, whatever he says, do it. She doesn't give up. She believes that he can do a miracle. She's asked him to do something about it. He's not exactly saying, okay, I'm right on that. Does it sound like some of our prayers? From time to time we ask God, we say, God, hey, would you fix this? Would you we please do something? Would you make this different? And he doesn't, ask, he doesn't answer it exactly the way we thought he would. And we go, well, that's it. We just kind of lob up some miracle prayers to God. Hey, God, fix this. It's like a rabbit's foot. It's like crossing your fingers. It's like lucky shoes. God, just another thing we try to go, maybe this will fix it. And we throw prayers up to him, hoping that he'll answer. But when he doesn't, we go, ah, eh, never mind, never hurts to ask. That's not Mary. His mom said, nope, I'm not taking no for an answer. He's going to do something. You just watch him and do what he asked you to do. I love the faith of Mary. I love that she is saying, listen, I'm not walking away from this. There's still a wine need, and my son can fix it, so pay attention to him. And that leads us, not just the need, not just the faith, but obedience to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the miracle worker here, right? But who does he use? Jesus technically never touches the wine or the water. As far as we know, he doesn't just pray over the water. Wine. He doesn't do that. It's not a magic trick. He wants to see if somebody's going to obey him first, and then a miracle is going to transpire. I don't know what happens if the servants go, no, that's gross, dude. People have been washing their hands in that for three days. I'm not serving anybody that. I want you to notice that they had to do three things. Jesus said, fill the tanks. Jesus said, draw the water out. And then I want you to take it to the master of the feast. By the way, this master of the feast is a really cool uh, Greek word. It literally means the Lord of the three couches. That's what the master of the feast is. You're like, what is that? Master of the three couches is the guy that sets up the three couches along the three walls in the main dining hall because they sit at recliners, kind of beds. 
So he's the master of the three couches, the ruler of the three couches. And he's in charge of the whole feast, which means he's kind of an important dude, which means don't serve him hand-washed water that's been used. There's got to be at least one servant going, I'm not filling those tanks. They're huge. I'm tired. There's got to be at least one servant going, I'm not taking this to him. I don't know, I don't know what this is going to be. I don't know if it turned to wine as they were walking. I don't know. All I know is that these servants did what Mary told them to do. They obeyed. Fill them. Draw some. Take it. And the reason some, sometimes you and I don't experience the miracles of Jesus Christ, I'm convinced, is because we just don't obey. There's simple obedience things he's asking us to do. Now, some of you are already calculating in your mind. You're going, I know how to create margin. I won't go to church. No. Okay. God wants you to come to church. He, you can't give up the things of God. You can't go, I'll create margin for God, but the things that I'll take away are the things that help me follow God. You might be saying, hey, I can free up Tuesday nights if I just quit my small group. No, don't do that. Hey, I'll, I'll just stop serving in the kids' department. Please, no, don't do that. We have to be obedient. God's still calling us to walk with him and to live for him. He's asking us to cut away the extraneous stuff in our lives. Unbelievably, many of us are trying to get closer to Jesus and his miraculous uh, healing touch without following him. Listen to that. We're trying to get closer to Jesus without following him. If you're here today and you're just ignoring Jesus' commands in your lives and you're not, not doing what he wants you to do, you're not participating in his body, the church. You don't love his body, the church, the way he does. You're not giving. You're not serving. You're not sharing your faith. You're not in a small group so you can grow together. I know you get tired of hearing me say small groups. Too bad I'm going to say it until God takes me out. Okay? All right, here's the deal. Because here's the deal. You're going you're gonna to grow closer to God by growing closer to other people who don't have it figured out. That's how we journey together. Okay, so, so here's the deal. Being obedient to Jesus is imperative for him to work miraculously. I don't know because these servants were obedient. But I suspect if these servants said, I'm not drawing that out. I'm not filling these things up. That Jesus may not have done a miracle. You may, well, Jesus can do anything. He can, but he rarely does anything without people who believe and then act. Rarely do you find miracles in the lives of people who are faithless and disobedient. Jesus is always asking people, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? And then he always gives them something to go do. He doesn't heal the blind guy. He just go, <laughs> he just walk in here, not blind, not blind, not blind. Walk, 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 walk. Raise from the dead, 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 dead. He could do that. But almost with every one of them, it's a personal encounter. He goes, hey, do you want to receive your eyesight? Yes. Okay, I'm smearing some mud on your eyes. Go wash it off. If you don't go wash it off, if you're not obedient to that, it's not going to be healed. Faith is in Jesus Christ is part and obedience is part of the miraculous life you and I see. I can't spend more time there because we got other stuff to do today like watch sports. Okay, not really. Um, I want to go to this word here in verse 11. This is the word that we're going to see several times as we go through this series called um, Miracles. Verse 11, the first of his signs. Why did Jesus turn the water to wine? It wasn't a trick. It wasn't just so he could show off that he has Jesus' powers. It wasn't because they particularly needed 180 gallons of wine, <laughs> right? Why did he turn the water to wine? It wasn't to grant his mom's request. It wasn't to save the pride of the bridal party. Why did he do it? It was a sign. This, this word in the Greek language means I'm pointing to something. I'm marking something. Jesus, I believe, is, is, this is a sign of the beginning of his kingdom. Today it starts. Here at this wedding, here in this place, I'm beginning the kingdom that is going to go through eternity. Miracles are marks of something that Jesus is up to eternally and spiritually. He never just does a miracle just for the fun of doing a miracle. He's pointing to something. It's a sign. And the water to wine was a sign for us in three different ways. Number one, water to wine is a sign that he's the ability to completely transform something. God... Through his son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, can take water and turn it into wine. He has the power to completely transform water, which we all drink and know what that is, into wine. 
That's powerful. That's transforming. And God has that same power to do that in our lives today. If we will just give him the time and pay attention to what he's doing in our lives, he will transform us completely. Remember earlier when I asked you about what your empty is. Today, everybody, let's just get into the sermon. What is empty in you today? What have you run out of today? Where have you come to the end of yourself? You have no more to give. There's nowhere to go. Where is it for you? What is it that you have none of today? Here's what I want to tell you, some good news. If he can change water to wine, he can change your situation into something great. He can rescue your marriage. He can turn your heart from being cold and heartless into loving and giving. God can change your past sins and turn you into a beautiful son or daughter of God. He's in the life of transformation. He's the life transformation business. It's what miracles are about. It's not water to wine. He's pointing to this. He's saying, I can do this. What can I do with you if you pay attention? He's a transforming God. If Jesus can fill empty wine containers, he can and he will fill us. Water to wine is then a sign of his transformation. It's a sign of his glory. He's always trying to point to God, and you know Jesus was God in the flesh, but he always refers to his Father. He said, I want you to understand something. This is about God. Look in verse 11. He manifested by this sign, he manifested his glory. The the word manifest in the Greek language literally means to shine on something. It's it's like he's clicking the lights on. Hey, I want you, you guys just think I'm this, this cool dude with a robe that walks through Galilee teaching and says smart things? No, let me click. I'm God. I want you to see the spotlight. I'm not just some smart teacher. I'm not just some good guy. I am God in the flesh. And miracles in our lives ultimately bring glory to Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're praying for a miracle and you're wondering why God's not doing often in my life, God's not doing miracles in my life because the glory is about me. It's for me. I want it for me. It's going to do me good. It's going to point to me. God doesn't do miracles like that. God never does a miracle that's not going to draw attention to himself. And only crazy people get in the way and say, I'll take credit for that. And in the Bible, you know what happens? <laughs> You're not taking the credit for what God does. So if it's for God's glory and you're praying for God to do a miracle, would you bring glory to his son Jesus Christ or to God himself, then step back because the wine is getting ready to be made out of water. One other thing, the water to wine is a sign for faith. I want you to see the the end story here. We've talked about Mary and how she must have believed to say, hey, do whatever he says. The very last of this passage, his disciples believed in him. The place where miracles take place or a place where the glory of God happens, where he's pointing to something eternal. But he does it for, here's what he does for us. He wants us to believe. These are brand new disciples. He just started recruiting them a week earlier. They've not seen him walk on water. They've not seen him heal the blind. They've not seen some of the miraculous stuff you and I get all excited about. They just saw him turn water into wine, and it says they believed. They began to have faith in him, that he really was who he says he was. And the reason that God does miracles in our midst sometimes is because he wants to show us that he is God. He wants us to trust him and believe him. But I want you to see something, since we're talking about time here, I want you to notice something with me in this passage. It was overwhelming to me as I studied it this week. Not everybody's faith was increased through this story. There were people at the wedding, including the ruler of the three couches, who had no idea that Jesus had done a miracle. They drank the wine. They were there. But they didn't know where it came from. It's possible that you and I can be at a wedding with Jesus and miss the miraculous work he's doing because we're not close enough to know. I believe that's happening all the time. I believe it's not a question of whether or not Jesus does miracle. The question is, are we there when they happen? Are we not there, but there? Are we so closely following Jesus that wherever he's working in this town, in our work, in our schools, on our streets, when, when he works, we notice the miracles because we're there. I would say that most of us are too busy to be there. 
And so I challenge you again, church. I want Eastview to become a place who is there, not running around, not too busy, not too hectic, not too crazy. I want, I want us to say, you know what? This is a confession. I'm busy. That's not a bragging point. It's a confession of sin. And then we begin to watch what God is going to do. Because I believe that if we give God presence over this next month, he's going to do two kinds of miracles. He's going to do miracles in us that he wants to do in us. And he's going to do miracles in the lives of people around us that he wants to do through us. I pray that this will be true, that we will declare war on busyness and that God will do amazing things in our midst. Let me pray for us. God, forgive us. I'm going to repent for me and for everybody who will accept it. Forgive us for being so busy. Some of us doing stuff for Jesus. We're so busy we don't even see Jesus. And I'm sorry that we're teaching our kids to be busy. I'm sorry that one of the leading things in our high schoolers' lives is stress. I'm sorry that we've taken the technology and we've sped up to speed beyond what you want us to go. God, I'm sorry that I'm hectic. I'm sorry that I try to cram too much stuff in. God, I want to be somebody who's present, who has time, who can see people, who can see you. God, would you make us into that kind of church? Would you convict us and change us? We're going to take some baby steps here. God, would you give us all kind of inspiration to do this together? We can't wait to see the miracles you do as we slow down. We praise you. We believe you can, Lord, and we ask that you will. In Jesus' name, amen.